Hi everyone, this is Kyla from Hidden Gems Literary Emporium. Today on our Ask the Author series, we have Miss Connie Ordohide Anderson, the author of this book right here, The Red Horse War Against God's Government. Thank you for joining us, Miss Connie. Good to be here. All right. And you are joining us all the way from which state? Nebraska. Nebraska. Is it cold in Nebraska? It's beautiful today. It's a beautiful autumn day. The leaves are falling and tomorrow we expect rain. So we've got to get out and break up the leaves before it rains. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Nebraska is one of the only states that I've never been to. So if we happen to ride on by, I'll definitely let you know. It's actually the old road from um, across America. And it goes through Kearney, Nebraska. And we have a big museum over the road. Uh, because it, it was the trail for the pioneers. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, so I want to begin by asking you to briefly introduce yourself and the premise of your book. Well, my name is Connie Anderson, and the premise of my book is War Against the Government of God. And in today's society, we see a lot of confusion about what is truth, who is truth, and how can we come closer to Jesus to know, to know him better and his righteousness, because he has a robe he wants to put on all of us, and that robe is his righteousness. And if we say we are not sinners and we're liars because we've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. So we're eager to know Jesus better and put on that robe of righteousness. And so the one of the first things that I noticed about your book is that it seems as though you've done a lot of research in reading. Is, would you say that was true? Uh, what, it, I started out to make this book for children, and the idea was to help them learn Bible symbols. So I began to realize that I was going to have to start drawing pictures, <laughs> and then how do you draw a sea of humanity? So when I asked the children at church, you know, if they would draw me a picture of a sea, they drew puddles and <laughs> lakes. <laughs> and then I told them, you know, in the Bible, waters turns into a sea of humanity. So God told, Jesus told his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And the disciples didn't know what that really meant. But the more time he spent with them, the more time he showed them is that we, we help people become better people. Uh, the disciples thought maybe they should call fire down from heaven and destroy the people. And Jesus said, I'm going to call you two the sons of thunder. <laughs> And how did this transition from being a, a children's book initially in your mind to a book, uh, I guess you could say for adults or teenagers and adults? Well, I thought, I thought if, I, if I taught the children the Bible symbols, they would, they would understand the Bible better. So I actually taught a class in Bible symbols. And when they drew a picture of a city, you know, where there were multitudes of peoples, nations, tongues, and people. We have more cows than people in Nebraska. And so the largest city is Lincoln. And in Lincoln, there's tall buildings. So they drew buildings. And then when I read the Bible verse, Revelation 8.8, 8, something like a great mountain on fire is thrown into a sea of humanity, they started drawing pictures of 9-11. They didn't stop. They, you know, they threw something on fire into those buildings and there were people falling out of the buildings. There, were, there, there was a cross that emerged out of the wreckage of 9-11 and there was an ambulance. Uh, so when the minister began to find out, I was teaching the children things like that. He, his wife was from Malaysia. 
And so he sat down and he drew a picture of a sea of humanity and he threw something like a great mountain on fire into the sea, into the sea of humanity. And he drew the twin towers in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> but that's a Malaysian country, you know, and these people would not want to destroy their own country. So the fact that these were American children in America who were very much aware of Bible symbols, they couldn't help what they drew. So when I went back to our prophetess in our church and she said she was visiting in New York and she said, great buildings will get taller and taller here. And she says, then I heard the alarm of fire and the firemen could not put out the fire. So she wrote that in 1906. But that happened in New York City. And one of our uh, authors who writes research books for the college students wrote in his book, God Cares One for Daniel and God Cares Two for Revelation. Imagine if you can today, a third world army entering Washington, D.C., and setting fire to the Pentagon and the White House. Page 239, God cares too. When I begin to realize that there were two authors who were predicting 9-11, then I realized that this prophecy was written by Jesus Christ. He was on the island of Patmos in 95, AD, giving this prophecy in Revelation to his best beloved friend, John. And John could not, of course, see airplanes or he couldn't understand it. He knew it would be in a day far in the future. But when God gave this prophecy to Daniel, when he was in Babylon, he said to Daniel, this prophecy will be closed until the time of the end. So we're living in the time of the end and there is a possibility that Daniel may even come out of his grave in this whole prophecy as it unwinds. So did I answer your question? I kind of went from, from teaching Bible symbols to, to it got me deeper into the Bible. You know, it was like, the the more I the more I got into the meaning of what I was seeing, and then it progressed, and now we're moving moving to the place <laughs> I did. Now we're moving to the place where Daniel is open, and Michael the archangel has stood up, and the heavenly courts have said, "We want Michael. We don't want Lucifer." Lucifer's name is found in Daniel in <laughs> Revelation nine eleven. And he's the king of the destroyers. And we are seeing this desire to destroy. But what's happening just recently is about two thirds of the Jews are finding their Messiah in, was prophesied in the Bible, even in the Garden of Eden. So the Jews are now like two thirds of the Jews are becoming converted to Jesus Christ. Which and that's think, something that, you, that happened recently, right? Just, in, just, you know, there's been Jews for Jesus, yes. And it, it's so exciting because they're going, he's our Messiah too. <laughs> Question, how many years have you been working on this? <laughs> yes. And how long did it take you to put this book together? Uh, well, like I said, the first book was just decoding the Bible prophecy in 9-11. And when I started adding the images and drawing pictures to go with it, it didn't take very long to put that together. And then pretty soon 
it evolved to the bigger picture of revelation and the soon coming of Jesus. And then when we saw Israel surrounded by enemies, God's enemies, and, and that text is in that text is in Daniel, and that's just happened in the last couple of weeks. So when you go to Daniel 2, things really do get exciting. And then the, the prophecy in Ezekiel 9 says that there will be six people. It's like warriors coming through the north gate to the Temple Mount. Have you been to Jerusalem? Have you seen the Temple Mount? <laughs> On the north side is the gate that opens up into the Via Della Rosa. And there are four angels guarding the Ark of the Covenant. And what's inside the Ark of the Covenant it are the 10 laws for the government of the universe. So that is holy. But there it says there are six men who come from the northern part of the Temple Mount. And that means those two witnesses in Revelation 11 who die come alive. And then there's a terrible earthquake, and then they're taken to heaven. But there's another prophecy that goes with that from Ellen G. White. She says, at that time, when we hear that thunder and that earthquake, you will hear the day and hour of Jesus coming. And there are all, there's, an, there's another, um, I, call, I call him a prophet, he wouldn't say that, who had a vision of after this happens and the two witnesses are taken to heaven. There's a, there's a period like the time of Jonah and the whale. Remember how Jonah didn't want to go there and the whole city of ancient Nineveh was, con was converted in, like, in less than 40 days as soon as they heard about it. And there's a reason why they did that because they had seen the Dead Sea. They had seen Sodom and Gomorrah. They had seen the white ashes you know, which are in near the Dead Sea. So they knew fire and brimstone and smoke was not anything they wanted to see. So they converted and, you know, the king put on sackcloth and mourned and they even put sackcloth on the animals. They didn't want their cows to die. <laughs> and I, and I, it, it gets me excited because um, when my son came home from college, in the spring of 2002, he walked through the door saying, what happens after 9-11? And he didn't even say, hi, mom, or give me a hug. And he sat down and he started reading out of this book by Ellen G. White, volume nine, starting on page 11 of Testimonies to the Church. And he was reading out loud, so I was trying to be a good bum, and I sat down and I thought, I've heard that before. And that's when I read someone else who used Bible symbols to translate Revelation 9-11. And then I begin to realize, this isn't me doing this. This, this is, and uh, in the first part of the book, <laughs> I get mine out. Revelation 10-7. Wait, what page are you on? I am on page 16, <laughs> Introduction to Bible Symbols. <laughs> okay. Okay. But in the day of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his prophets, Revelation 10, 7. So when we come down to the seventh angel, that's the sign of completion. That's the sign of God sounding. I want you all to put on the robe of my righteousness. I want you all to come to heaven with me. Um, you sound 
like you read a lot? Well, when I first started out, I was in church school for about six years. And then I was in Denver and they, they would begin to integrate the schools. And we had a new school going opening in South Denver. And my mother decided that we needed to go to public school. So I realized I wasn't getting that Bible class. And in the last year in school, we were building a miniature sanctuary. And one of the boys was making an altar and, and one of the boys was making the menorah. And I just happened to have, mother had a, a skin. A, and so I got to put the skin over the temple. And as we begin to study, we know where Jesus is by where he is in the heavenly sanctuary. So as we begin to study the heavenly sanctuary, I got excited to read. There's a time, you know, when that veil was cut and there was nothing inside, you know, when they came to. But there was there were some things inside because the Romans hauled off the seven branch menorah candlestick and it was in Rome. When Jesus passes that veil, he comes out to the altar of incense. And there is where he's daily listening to our prayers and he's putting our prayers in his nail scarred hands. And he loves us and he's listening. But there comes a time, and, and in, in the Jewish system, they call it Yom Kippur. They take the sins of the year and they put them on the head of Satan. Well, because Jesus is our high priest, he is doing that now. When we pray and we ask for God's help and we ask for to be saved by the blood of the lamb and have Jesus Christ as our redeemer, he takes that prayer and he puts that on the head of Satan. And that's why the devil is angry. And that's why he is against Jesus Christ because he wants to be worshiped. So yes, there's writing and studying, but I there's hidden gems in those books behind me. <laughs> um, one of the things that Ellen White said, and I think we all know it has to happen, is those 10 laws that are hidden in Jerusalem, right under our nose, will come out of hiding. And I would really like to be a part of that. I just, I think that would be so exciting knowing all the work that Ron Wyatt has done and knowing that they found the dried blood of Jesus Christ with 24 chromosomes, when they put the dried blood in water, it comes alive. And they have known that since 1982. And in the Holy Sepulchre Church, the Armenian division, they have a little cross that's been cut out of the cross of Jesus Christ. They've tested that blood. And you can't not, you can, you can test the DNA of a pharaoh, but you can't test the chromosomes because that blood doesn't come alive. You put water with his blood, it comes alive. Uh, we get 23 chromosomes from our mom, 23 from dad. We have 46. If one of those duplicates, we have 47 chromosomes and that's, that would be a Down syndrome. But there's no way anyone could live with 24 chromosomes. Mary gave him 23 of her chromosomes, but the Y chromosome makes Jesus Christ a male. And it just so happened that I wanted to go and experience Yom Kippur in Jerusalem. So when I got there and I'm, I'm, drive, I'm driving, I'm by myself and I'm driving a car up, it's all right-hand drive and it's Signs are in English and Greek and what are there? <laughs> Hebrew and Aramaic, Arabic. What is it? Egyptian? It's no problem getting there. It was just trying to find a parking place on Friday night because they closed their doors on Friday night. So <clears throat> I wanted I I wanted to know what Yom Kippur was. What I didn't know is they they close down all the highways and streets in town. And when you're the only car on the highway and you're going around these signs, 
And then you come up to one of the check stations. <laughs> they said, well, we really didn't expect to see anybody here today. I, um, so that evening, I, I heard the grates going up down the street where the businesses were opening. And I went into this antique store. Now my mother worked in an, with antiques on Broadway in Denver. And I recognized some of the really neat things in his shop. And in comes this rabbi and he's like bouncing in. And he said, oh, you're so lucky to be me. I'm the rabbi and I'm the representative to the Pope. And I, he was, and then he began to bombard me with this question. Where do you live? How many children do you have? Are they cut? Yes, they're circumcised. And he was so anxious to bombard me with questions. I just knew I could ask him one. <laughs> and I said, you have the blood of our Messiah. And he said, you know that? And then he started talking in Hebrew to Eli ben David, the owner. It's like it had, it had, they had kept it a secret. They found the blood in 1982, and then they would find a really educated man, you know, a genius like, and then they give him the blood. And from what I found out is that when they, when, when you have the blood of Jesus and you see an accident, you feel so much compassion for the people. It's like your mother and sister have died. It's horrible. And they have saying, you know, take my brain out, just cut, die me, just look at the brain, but don't let me have to experience this pain and suffering. So by 1990, the first time I visited there, they already had the blood of Jesus to examine and uh, you know, for eight years. And by the time I went there in 2005, uh, when I told him, you have the blood of our Messiah, I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know if he had it personally in his veins or if he just had a sample or what. But since he was so eager to explain to the owner of the store. And the next thing I asked him, I said, you know Ron what? And he said, Yes, I know Ron Wyatt, who was the man who discovered it. The unique thing about Ron Wyatt was is he wasn't a Jew and he was a Sabbath keeper. So anybody who goes into that most holy place would definitely have to, you know, I, I would say, well, like, do we take off our shoes? You know, it's, it's like holy ground. And the direction of the crucifixion of Jesus, the garden tomb, is just north of the city gates. So it's very possible that procession could come from the garden tomb in the Damascus gate, up the hill and up the Via della Rosa and come back the same way Jesus left to the top of the garden tomb. Uh, the conversion of the Jews is important to me because they were the ones that said, let his blood be upon our heads and the heads of our children. And the concentration camp, the Holocaust, is like the curse of God, they invited it. And I don't want the blood of Jesus on my hands. And if you ask the Jews today, you know, would you crucify Jesus again? They're gonna say, no, 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 no. So as the Jews are coming around, the question of what are the real commandments? What do they really say? And I did talk to the lady who was in charge of antiquities. She said, you can go digging in the garden tomb. You don't need a permit. Not that I want to or ever would. But the Ten Commandments was the thing inside the Ark of the Covenant that made the Ark of the Covenant so holy. The two angels in heaven were supposed to guard the laws for the government of God. And according to the Jews, there are male and a female angel guarding the government of God. So this idea of Mary, the mother of Jesus, being the queen of heaven doesn't fit into Lucifer being the other guardian angel on the temple mount, on the Ark of the Covenant. 
so all of these all of these mysteries and all of these things that are happening so much you know and and the jews know that there is going to be an anti they, they say christo they're against jesus they know there's somebody coming against jesus christ and so Jerusalem is surrounded by enemies. So now we have to decide now, who do we want to worship? Who do we really love? You know, do we really love Jesus Christ? And we really want to put the robe of his righteousness around us? Yes, I do. I'm saved by the blood of the lamb. Jesus Christ is my savior too. So this, this great climate change thing that's going on right now, it, you know, in United Nations is trying to fix a penalty upon those who don't work towards climate change. Just like they're trying to put a penalty on those who don't want to take COVID vaccine. And this penalty in some states is already picking up. I mean, like, here's a fee. But in the Bible, it says we won't be able to buy or sell. And that's, a, you know, when you, hear, when you hear the rabbis talk about this, all of your debts are forgiven. And that sounds like a good thing to me. Because there's nothing in this world I need to take to heaven. Except my children and my family. Question. Um, and how long ago was it the last time you've been to Jerusalem? Uh, 19, uh, 2015 with my husband. Oh, okay. Do you have any plans to go back? Well, that date that my husband and I were in Jerusalem was March 17. And it's been... Nineteen. It was it was about three years ago, and that's important because we know there's a time of trouble. We know there's a uh, a limit to how long this question is going to go go on about who are we going to worship. And so the the question is, will I go back? And that's in God's hands. And the way it's working is it's his timing. And when it's his timing, I will be happy to get on that plane. I'm 74. I have uh, two wonderfully blessed children. One's a dentist and one's a nurse CNA who is doing flipping houses and having fun doing that. I, I, I feel like, you know, if, if, it's, if it's my turn to die, and be dead three and a half days, come alive and go to heaven. Why would I turn that down? <laughs> I mean, I'm watching my old friends in their 90s go into the nursing home. My aunt and uncle are in the nursing home. And um, I, I, uh, being, being a martyr is a gift. It's not something you want to do. I mean, it's like, oh, I'm going to die. So I might as well go to heaven and die first. <laughs> It's not that, it's, it's wanting to glorify God and his kingdom and letting people know. I, I think the real essence of everybody's question about God, who is the way, the truth, and the light, is did he really go to heaven? Do we really believe Jesus died and rose again? And I think this is the question that is so critical because... If, if everybody would see two sinners forgiven, come alive, take it to heaven. And I know I qualify. I don't want to go there. <laughs> um, then everybody would have a chance to believe. And Mrs. White says the trip from earth to Orion, where God is still making and tossing out suns, moon, stars, and galaxies, will take seven days. And the speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. 
you know, that sounds like breakneck speed, <laughs> something that our engineers are thinking about right now. But wouldn't it be fun to just watch Earth get smaller behind and then to step into a heaven where there's no sickness, sorrow, or pain? And if I can encourage people to think about heaven and meeting their Jesus, and there's another funny thing Ellen G. White said. She said, there's a planet filled with all different sizes of Jesus. And so when you get to heaven, you're going to meet your Jesus. And you're going to look into his eyes and know that he died for you. Um, I, I've, I've, I've thought about walking, you know, down that hill to the tree of life. And, you know, going through a big forest and thinking, what's, what's that in the bushes? Should I be scared, you know? And then it's not anything but a giraffe. And I'm, I'm feeling like something's heckling Jesus. What is that? Oh, that's a monkey on his neck. <laughs> I, I mean, can we actually imagine what it would be like to be a place where we have no fear? Are we going to have to get over it when we get to heaven? You know, we won't have to worry about our children sin swimming in the pool and drowning or anything like that, which did happen to my son. And he's alive after a miracle and he's well and 38 years old. So all of these adversities help us plan for the joy of salvation, which is a free gift. Uh, there, 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 there's a way to get rid of demonic spirits and that is where the name of Jesus is the devil can't be my mother was in world during, during World War II she was, went up to Evergreen, Colorado and they were playing with the Ouija board and as soon as my mother stepped in the, in the room the Ouija board wouldn't work she knew that wherever the name of Jesus is, the devil can't be. As soon as she and her girlfriend stepped out of the room, the Ouija board would work again. So I, I want everybody to know that spiritualism and the occult can be, um, it, it just goes away. I, I, I saw a girl healed of demon possession. Um, we handed out invitations for Bible studies. And we had 66 Bible studies to give. <laughs> I was given one and this man called up and he says, my daughter is, is divorced now, but she was married to a husband who was drinking cat's blood. I said, no problem. So we started Bible studies and uh, they, they moved to another house and he said, Connie, things are flying around in here. So I came over and we prayed in the back bedroom and asked God to remove all the evil spirits then we went to the bathroom in the next bedroom we got to the living room and norma said there it is and she looked out the window and she she saw the blackbird and we got in the car and we followed the bird over the stanislaus river and there was a park on the other side it was really deep green grass and norma is like i'm five three and she's like 5, 10, 11, and she's like three times my size. And I think I'm just gonna sing, gonna walk with my Jesus down by the riverside. And about that time, I turned around and looked at Norma and she was foaming at the mouth and she just toppled like a tree. When she woke up, you know, I just, I just put her head in my lap. And when she woke up, I said, you know, it's Friday night. Why don't we prepare for Sabbath. Why don't we go get some food? Before, Norma had asked me for hair color and hairspray. And I said, I'm not going to buy that kind of stuff. And I was curious, what would she do when we got in the grocery store? And Norma got food, appropriate food, and she never asked for any hair thing. And so I dropped her off by a trailer and said bye. And I went home to take care of my family. And her dad called back and he says, I don't know what you did, but thank you. <laughs> and it was, it was just such a joy. She wasn't baptized at the time, but she was baptized later. And she really loved to sing with the joy of the Lord. I, I have a very fondness in my heart for, for the people that um, I met. There was a, 
a, a girl who had been converted to Christianity. She used to be a, in a bar. She was a bartender and she used to do pole dance with snakes and stuff. She's as white as white can be, white hair, white everything. And she's working at Hunt's um, fruit packaging. She's a forklift driver. <laughs> and her girlfriend was this wonderful, I, I'm gonna uh, Afro-American. And she invited her to church. And she is such a crazy, wonderful lady. And when, and when I'm in her church, I just love the way they sing. And then she invited me to be in a choir. And it was just, you know, I just, I just love experiencing that feeling. And on Valentine's Day, every woman was wearing a red dress and a red hat. <laughs> so I just, I've been, I've been exposed to other cultures. We were missionaries in Singapore for a uh, fill-in for about three months. And I just came to love the Chinese people and to go out jogging through the Muslim cemetery that has a post on each end of the grave, pictures on the graves. Do you have any other questions? <laughs> I got off the <laughs> No, I do. Um, I think I have about two more. My first one is, do you plan on writing any other books or a follow-up? No. No, um, when and if this happens, it's Revelation 11, and there's two witnesses who come to Jerusalem, and they can start the plagues, like Moses and Aaron going before the Pharaoh, and they can say, you know, the first plague's going to be, it's not going to rain here until we finish with this, and not having rain anywhere right now is not a good thing. And I don't like that idea. I really don't like that idea. Like you want to curse. That's God's plan. No rain. And then they are giving the ability to, to put as many plagues on as they want, as often as they want. They don't have to drag it out. But I'm not sure who we would go to except to say, if we are the two witnesses, then it's not going to rain. And if you want to see God work, um, the first plague is going to be a horrible sores and boils all over your body, kind of like Job had, you know, the kind he scraped with pottery. And it, then the camels died and the horses died. Uh, I think God can bring Job's, permit the devil to bring Job's troubles on us because the devil wants to destroy us anyway so that's a, a, a very ugly part of this thing to me bringing the ten commandments out is also if we're not worthy and if we're not saved by the blood of the lamb we'll die anyway but we get to die trying to glorify god so there's no reason to write a new book because all you have to do is turn to Revelation 11, turn to Ezekiel 9 and Daniel 12. And that will tell you where we are right now in history. When Israel is surrounded by enemies, that's the fulfillment of Daniel 11. When Michael stands up, he stands up in the heavenly sanctuary. And when he leaves the heavenly sanctuary, he passes by the altar of incense. He's moving out of the most holy. He passes by the seven branch menorah. He, pan he passes by the showbread. And since the Ark of the Covenant is in the garden tomb, if we are accepted by God, we will either live or die. And if we do, and if we do get to the Northern Gate, um, then we have the guides of Michael, Gabriel, Uriel, and Raphael. So we will be taking orders from them when and if it happens. And if it's not me and someone else, then praise the Lord. God is still going to fulfill this prophecy. He keeps his promise. And I like the one, the promise that he has. That I will contend with those that contend with thy children. Because God loves our children. And when he comes again, he's going to 
bring those babies from the grave. And I have a brother I've never met. My mother's first child died in childbirth. And I'm looking forward to raising my brother in heaven. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Miss Connie. Um, Red, the Red Horse is here at Hidden Gems Literary Emporium. If anybody is interested, please come by 55B Morris Street in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Or if you give us a call at 609-361-4331, you can get this book shipped to your house. Um, yes. So thank you, Ms. Connie, for joining us all the way from Nebraska. We hope to see you soon. And thank you so much for your work. Just bless you. And thank you for this opportunity. And if, if you ever have any questions, please send me an email. And I, I would like to extend that to your readers also, or people who uh, see Absolutely, video. absolutely. Um, what is your email address and where can people find you online? I actually have a blog site, www.theredhorsebook.wordpress.com. Um, the email is C Anderson, C A N D E R S O N 607 at frontiernet.net. Okay. And if it's okay with you, Ms. Connie, we would like to put that information in the description of this video. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, thank you again, Ms. Connie. Thank you so much. And God bless your family. Yeah, I love the name having your son Truth. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All we want, and we spoke about this on the phone, but we want all of our children to have the first name of a virtue, something that they can remember as they grow up and as they're on the playground, you know, when they're teenagers, when they're old, elderly, <laughs> we want them to, you know, live and grow in that virtue. So um, I, wanted to name, I wanted to name my daughter Grace, Gracie. Beautiful. <laughs> when you have your girl. <laughs> right. Um, keep us in prayer. She'll probably be here soon. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. are you pregnant? Yes. Praise the Lord. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Um, I'm looking because he has a leaf in his mouth. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, really quick question. How many years apart are your children? They're five. Oh, five years apart. Okay. My husband was an only child and he was really not interested in having children. Oh, wow. We were married 11 years before I got to have a first baby. <laughs> wow. So I was like my grandma raised. So my son's 38. Oh, okay. Youngest son. Right. Do you have any grandchildren as of now? Two. A little boy and a little girl. A big boy who's almost six foot tall. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm not so little. Years old. Wow. Okay. So, so I, 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 I'm, I'm like a grandma raising kids and now I, <laughs> right. I'm trying to be young. <laughs> well, they say a mother's job is never done. That's true. <laughs> Um, okay, thank you, Ms. Connie, again. It's been so much fun, thank you. So thank you. Um, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we, got it, we will um, be seeing you again very soon. Thank you, God bless. Have a good day.